All right, welcome everybody to another edition of Legal Tech Week, the show where we talk about the top stories in legal tech and innovation over the past week. Today is September 22nd, 2023, and uh, among the topics today, we have the uh, ignominious ouster of a legal tech CEO uh, <laughs> related shareholder lawsuit against that legal tech company. I was going to talk about a law firm hit with a class action and about a couple of different AI summits that took place this week involving AI and law. So uh, with that, uh, I'm Bob Ambrosi. Uh, I write the blog Law Sites and uh, have the podcast Law Next. We have a small panel today, and a few of our regulars aren't able to make it, especially after last week's gala 100th <laughs> episode celebration with 20 different panelists. Uh, we're, uh, we're a small group this week, but uh, let's uh, introduce ourselves starting, uh, who wants to kick it off, Nikki? I am happy to kick it off small but mighty. That's what this panel is. Exactly. Um, <laughs> my name is Nikki Black. I am the head of SME and external education at um, Affinapay, uh, and, which it owns my case and LawPay. Um, I write legal tech columns for ABA Journal, about law and the daily record. And um, I also oversee and write the benchmark reports in the my case and law pay side and also our um, annual legal industry report. And I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. And Stephanie. Hello, I'm Stephanie Wilkins. I'm the editor in chief of Legal Tech News at ALM. Stephanie still has her party lighting on from last week's celebration, I think. <laughs> It's Friday and, afternoon. Uh, <laughs> Friday afternoon. And uh, last but not least, Steve. Hey, uh, Steve Embry. I write the blog Tech Law Crossroads, and I'm glad to be here to kick off the next 100 episodes. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Um, well, uh, let's uh let's kick it off for this uh starting off in the road toward the next 100 episodes with this uh ignominious ouster if we can do that uh stephanie you uh you've uh covered this this week what's going on oh boy yeah it was um <laughs> yeah wednesday my train back from boston from the summit that we will talk about was just writing a lot about disco so, I mean, we all heard the news, you know, that Kiwi suddenly was stepping down like a week or two ago, whenever that was, and people were curious why. They didn't really say anything at the time, just he'll help with the transition, whatever, I'm out. And then the news actually broke in a Wall Street Journal exclusive. Um, I didn't expect it to come out that fast. I had heard late, late the night before that the Wall Street Journal was investigating something, and I thought it was going to be an ongoing thing. I'm like, oh, I'll look at it in the morning, and the next morning the article was already out. Um, yeah, the, a lot of allegations of sexual misconduct against Kiwi, um, dating back, the, we officially reported allegations for at least a year or more. There was reportedly, this is all from the Wall Street Journal, uh, reportedly an incident at a dinner, I think it was on September 6th, uh, that triggered something enough. It was a groping of a young female employee. It triggered enough for the board to bring in the law firm Cooley to do a formal investigation. And the story is that the board asked for his ouster. I mean, this is all, this is just their reporting. We um, looked, if you look at in our article, we link to, you know, there's a whole Reddit thread about this, which is pretty awful. There's a lot on Glassdoor too, just about the toxic culture. Um, We've been hearing from a lot of people, obviously like off the record or just a lot of general reactions. And we haven't even tried to attribute any of that yet. Everything we posted is purely public at this point, you know, because these topics have to be very delicately handled in my opinion, even though it is important to talk about them. But yeah, I mean, it sounds like all the public reports are very, very damning of Kiwi. And not just Kiwi, but the fact that the culture there has gone on so long, it led to other males in the company acting, maybe not the sexual misconduct, but definitely discriminatory and harassment conduct towards women. And HR kind of a lot, definitely some allegations out there in public of HR not doing anything about it. So that's a question. Again, I'm not, I can't, I can neither confirm or deny those, but they're out there for the public to read very clearly. And I have not yet seen anyone step up and say, this is outlandish. I can't believe this. This is wrong. 
Um, there's a lot of general consensus of, oh, it always seemed odd. We didn't know it was that bad. So I don't know. But then also that same day, once I got that story off, turned out a complaint uh, surfaced, uh, uh, our law.com radar surfaced a complaint that is a shareholder class action against Dis Disco, Kiwi, and another current, their current um, CFO, LaFlair, uh, alleging that since their, after their IPO, they material mis materially misled investors to the tune of a lot, a lot of losses um, because they knew key clients were leaving and they were not getting business from them, but they were putting in all of their SEC filings that their, you know, this giant growth strategy they had was built on maintaining these key clients when they knew it wasn't true. So that was sort of a double whammy. And I mean, I guess I can stop talking for a second and let other people weigh in, but I guess the jaded person in me is that, yeah, the sexual stuff had maybe had been going on for a while, but now really with the shareholder lawsuits and the money, they really needed to get them out. But again, that's just, you know, that's just my two cents based on my thoughts. But yeah, happy to have other people chime in on this. It's a lot. It's a lot going on all at once. And it was a lot of, I, I woke up in Cambridge that morning, not planning to write any stories about disco. And I wrote two. <laughs> so... It's a disco bad news party. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> I learned that they share the same building as we do at Affinite, which I did not know. They are our literal neighbors <laughs> in Austin. Mm. So that's what I, I learned about somehow. this whole How did event. You not know that? I, <laughs> I think they were both I, I at that... a conference I was at. Your, uh, your CEO and Kiwi were both at a conference I was at, and they were talking to each other, and that came up. I think it may have been mentioned peripherally in the past, but I never really had it set in my head which e-discovery company it was. I just knew it was one of the big ones and I never really paid attention. Now I know. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's pretty, um, pretty, uh, there's definitely, it seems like there's, there's no way that those two things just happened to make the news and happen to occur at just about the same time. I mean, there's gotta be something going on in the backdrop, but who knows what. Yeah. Well, yeah, and then this all of this comes on the heels of the big story about his outrageous pay package of a hundred million dollars, you know, putting him uh, at, at a, one of the most highest paid CEOs anywhere in the tech world, let alone in the in the legal tech world. Um, although I do, I, I'm still I continue to have trouble getting my arms around exactly what that pay package was. I finally went around and, and looked at the at the. Uh, um, the, the disclosure document uh, from Dis Disco that that spells it all out, and it, it appeared he hasn't really received. He never really received any of that. That was all uh, uh, milestones he could achieve if if the stock uh, hit certain uh, price points, which were so far beyond where the stock is right now that it seemed highly unlikely that the stock had any. Uh, prospect of meeting those price points within the time frame that would have been required for him to earn that money, um, but but still there was such a there was such negative fallout about that story as well, and you have to wonder again whether you know whether that could have been part been what kind of set set some of the gears in motion here of of other stuff starting to come out and other people starting to sniff around and see what was going on there and i kind of you know, i kind of had an inkling the wall street journal was sniffing around because when we all reported on him suddenly stepping down they had an article that was like hey wouldn't this mean he's leaving a lot of stuff on the table why would that be and just let that linger out there yeah yeah that yeah, was I was kind of struck as you guys were talking about, you know, how many, how many times have we heard similar stories in the sort of the tech community in general? Uh, and, about, and legal, honestly. Yeah. 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 And now it's, I mean, this is, this is some of the worst reported behavior that I can recall. I'm sure that's the tip of the iceberg. Um, that yeah. is unfortunate. Yeah. All the way well, that's, that was sort of, I mean, my thinking was what was described, honestly, was not all that shocking. So I feel like there's got to be more because I kind of feel like, honestly, that's like par for the course. Like this happens in law firms all the time. It still does. I mean, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news and people that think it doesn't, but um, I, I felt like for him to just get summarily dumped like that with apparently his whole pay package going down the drain too, that was kind of, granted a lot of it included the stocks but still that's unusual you know 
for him, usually they'll leave a company and they'll take all that with them. And there's some sort of severance package or something, but right. so I feel like there's gotta be something else. Well, um, that would certainly, certainly, or proof of it. Certainly suggest that. Yeah. And I think, you know, go, ahead, Bob. go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, there was the, uh, he he had had um, negative allegations in the past. Back after when he was, you know, there was uh, back when he was in law school, there were uh, allegations circling around. Actually, they circled after he got out of law school. But that while he was in law school, he had uh, uh, been part of a, uh, a discussion group that uh, circulated some emails in which he made some uh, very explicit racial slurs in the course of. Uh, circulating sort of sort of discussing some issues uh, with with some law school classmates and, and that came out after I, think, I forget if it came out while he was in law school or, or just after he was, came out of law school but uh, interestingly he was on he was on my podcast uh, it was a year ago two years ago now I forget when he was on but but he kind of talked about the fact that that the the, the misfortune of of those allegations against him which he didn't admit on my podcast. I don't remember whether we explicitly talked about them, but the misfortune of them uh, turned out at that point, he saw it as almost like a, a blessing because it put his career on a whole different track uh, because of the fact that because there had been these allegations against him, he wasn't able to go into the sort of the traditional associate big firm track and he went off in a whole different direction and worked at a small plaintiff's I think, class action firm, made a name for himself and doing some litigation work. That led to sort of kind of dealing with some of the technology around litigation, uh, getting into e-discovery, and then eventually starting Disco. So in a way, he was kind of at that point saying, in, in a way, some of that misfortune worked to his fortune ultimately. Uh, I, this time, I don't know whether he's going to be so lucky. And I, I think I don't, he I don't had know. The... I don't know. I don't know, Bob. It sounds like based on what I've read a lot about recently, it sounds like he sounds like he would have fit in real well at Big Law. I know. Well, and I think he had the, the you know, fortunate for him ability to say, hey, when I, I'm like all of you all, when I was a first year law student, I was 16. Remember, he was this prodigy, right? Um, yeah. He could be so like, I, I got was the youngest ever kid. graduate from Harvard Law, right? Yeah, he graduated at 19 from Harvard Law. But to Nikki's point of there has to be more out there, I mean, I think that's definitely true. But if this is as big as it seems like we know I mean it's like people don't want to talk they're terrified or they have NDAs or they have you know I mean I feel like this is going to be the kind of thing where over time things will or will not come out and it's not you know a story you can rush because also I mean yeah. you have to be delicate about it because there's plenty of people that unwillingly are now part of this story that don't want to be but at the same time I mean it's, it's a tale as old as time with all of these harassment cases right unfortunately like, how do you do it? And like, I saw whoever was in the, someone in the chat was like, is it a tech growth thing? Is it a law thing? I think legal tech is in this weird confluence of two historically very male dominated spaces. So while there's a lot of lights to be you know, shown on women doing great things, which they are, and we're doing it, historically, we're coming from two areas where a lot of these cultures just festered for decades unchecked. Yeah, it the I, I I can't think of how many legal tech companies I've interviewed that talk about their aspiration to at some point go public. Uh, Disco is one of the very few legal tech companies that ever, in fact, did go public. Uh, and uh, you know, maybe this is also an example of be careful what you wish for. Not not that that has to do with his his direct behavior in terms of sexual harassment, but, you know, the, the, the shareholder suits, uh, and I'm sure more will follow, uh, oh, yeah. uh, are, are, uh, are something that, uh, you know, you, you open yourself up to, uh, and also just greater scrutiny, uh, uh, of your, of your earnings, uh, and, uh, operations when you go public. Uh, I mean, they went public, you know, with, with great fanfare and, uh, their stock just kind of immediately crashed and, and never recovered. Um, yeah. So it hasn't been a, it hasn't been a pretty picture. And then I remember what was it, what, it like a year ago or so after it crashed, he was he was saying, well, this is you know e-discovery is a tough industry and it's very cyclical and you know litigation goes up and litigation goes down and it's hard to predict our revenues and well you know yeah but that's the industry you're in I mean, that's the business you're I know. in. So, but then you could also not say in your SEC filings that our growth strategy is built on 
our key clients knowing your key clients are gone. I mean, that's what the allegations say. Yeah. 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 And, but I mean, yeah. I do. And I think it really, I mean, I don't always want to be this jaded person. That's why I always have happy to have Nikki on the call with me. Cause I feel like we're always in the same camp. <laughs> you need but another like, jaded person with you? <laughs> well, no, because like <laughs> ultimately, like, I think people are going to care more about the financials than the other stuff, than the sexual stuff. Yeah. And, and we're jaded for a reason, by the way. I don't think you just pop out of the womb jaded. <laughs> True. True. I don't know, maybe, I mean, but yeah. <laughs> yeah I, mean, I mean, our collective experience, as I'm sure, I mean, I haven't talked to you specifically about this, but after a while, it just makes you jaded because you feel like it's never going to change. It's not going to change for my kids, you know? It's, and and just and I also don't understand this these things make the news and people still think that it's just amazing to me how these men and you know some of these are all some things are unproven allegations both in this case and in many other cases but it's just sort of amazing to me that people sort of feel like they're somehow protected or it's not going to happen to them and they just sort of behave in this way throughout their work lives and it just amazes me how it always just keeps happening. <laughs> And I mean, but the what number has of, changed no, is it, yeah. it's just a, I think we should make a shout out to the fact that, I mean, over the last, especially over the last five years, over the last 10 years, the numbers of women in leadership positions in legal technology, as in maybe technology, well, I don't know about technology more broadly, but in legal technology, it's certainly uh, gone up significantly. And because I, I remember, you know, Kristen Sunday used to do that sort of occasional or semi annual or whatever list of uh, 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 people of color and, and, and women in, in, uh, in legal tech. And, and it was a really dismal picture for, uh, for a long time. And, uh, you know, it, it's not that we've gotten to where we need to be in terms of the numbers, but, uh, you know, I mean, you know, Nikki, your company is, is a reflection of this. There's a, a, a number of female executives, including your CEO, leading the company and uh you know i just had the uh, uh latera ceo i mean the, the, a number of companies now do have uh, women at the top and in executive positions and hopefully that will help move the culture forward on this issue you're totally well, correct about that but like um uh justice ginsburg said like when will you be happy in terms of the number of women on the supreme court she's like when there's nine right, right? because there's been nine <laughs> men forever the fact that there's a few more women CEOs when there should be 50%, um, if you're going to, more than 50%, if you're going to look at the percentage of the population. Um, and same with people of color. You know, it, there's, it's still like a drop in the bucket compared to the proportions um, in terms of the okay. populations, the percentages. So that's, you know, it's, it's progress by, you know, itsy bitsy steps, you know. <laughs> Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm not saying we're where we need to be. I'm no. just saying it's 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 a lot better than it was even just five years ago. Well, and there are multiple. I was like, like men who I highly respect and I think are definitely on the right of good here had the immediate visceral reaction of like, why do these men still think it's okay that, that they can get away with this kind of shitty behavior? And I'm like, because by all accounts, they have gotten away with it. If these right. allegations are true, this wasn't a first incident. Like. People have gotten away with it. We've seen it in other industries with of epic proportions. That's why they think they can. I mean, they don't think they can. They know they can. Yeah. And usually did. Yeah. I mean, I was. <laughs> I started this job a year ago and was not planning to be like an investigative journalism journalist about legal text Me Too movement. But like, if. I feel like there's just going to be so many people coming out, not even at Disco necessarily, being like everybody. I would be shocked if there is a woman in the legal industry or tech industry that does not have a story. It may not be, you know, sexual assault, but a story. Yeah. yeah. Multiple stories. I would, yeah. I would, I would even change that and say I would be shocked if there weren't women that had multiple stories since the start of their legal or tech career. Yeah. That is, and I, I think I think it was you, Nikki, that that made the very good point that you know it's not just the legal tech companies; it's the law firms. Law firms mm -hmm. probably as bad, if not worse. Hell yeah! I mean, it is you know, partner with a big book of business. It's, law firms are notorious for not doing something about that person. 
And there was just that Rolling uh, Stone. I just saw it today. The guy who had been like the editor of Rolling Stone forever, and then um, John Wetter, right. Rock uh, yeah. Rock Hall of Fame, and how he's suddenly just facing a similar situation based upon a comment that he made in the interview. And the comment is what I thought was so telling about where we are. He basically said something that a male relative of mine said about a woman in their, our family years ago. They never really, the women never say anything very interesting. You know, they don't, they don't come from a place of depth. They don't yeah. say things that interest oh, yeah. me. So therefore they don't deserve coverage. They don't deserve awards. And the people, and it's, I, it's half the time I feel like men don't see, and I'm generalizing, but a lot of men don't see women as a full fledged person yeah. versus like arm candy. Yeah. Well, oh, worse, yeah. I mean, he he said it of, about women and people of color as well. Basically, any, anybody who's not a white male uh, yeah. doesn't have anything intellectually in, in, intriguing to say is basically yeah. what he was saying. That's what it their was. their yeah. work isn't worthy of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because it didn't have the creativity or depth or whatever of all these white dudes that were in there. Yeah. And I think a lot of men think this, you know, and yeah. unless you look just like them and come from the same place that they do, they just don't think that you have anything to contribute. And that's sort of this invisible barrier it's sort of like that like glass ceiling that a lot of women encounter without even dealing yeah. with all of this assault and you know harassment you know i i have i have twice in a significant way uh had uh allegations brought to my attention against particular individuals in the legal tech industry for outrageous sexual harassment uh, and um, wanting me to write about it. But then when I say, well, you know, will you go on the record about it? No, I can't go on the record about it. I understand yeah. that. But can I, can I talk about your situation if, if I don't identify you? Well, no, because if you do that, they're going to know who it is who's talking. They're going to recognize who I am. Well, do, can you tell, point me to anybody else I can talk to? Yes, I can. And they point me to other people I can talk to. And those, I get the same answers from those other people. And so, I mean, there was one person who had, I, I talked to easily six different women who had severe, who had the same and, and pretty severe allegations against this person all enthusiastically telling me I should write about it, <laughs> but I couldn't write about it. And I, I mean, I don't know what you do about that. I, I, there's nothing, and, and, you know, from my point, perspective, I mean, I'm, there's nothing I could do. I mean, I can't, you just can't write this stuff saying lots I've heard, you know, yeah. I, I've heard through the grapevine. Um, so I don't know. And let's not forget, it was only what, a year ago, a little bit more that they finally got, they overruled, I mean, they, there used to be mandatory arbitration for sexual assault claims and harassment claims everywhere. So it would just be behind closed doors. And there was a whole group of women that worked together to finally outlaw that. Now they're going after NDAs. I mean, there's been systemic legal frameworks around letting this stuff get out. Yeah. And, and in the legal space, somebody was just talking to me at the conference that I, um, the DC conference, the summit, um, separately, like over lunch about, um, I don't remember her name, you'll probably, one of you will probably remember, woman who oversees the judicial um, uh, accountability. Um, there's a um, group that is a judicial accountability group um, and that now has funding and they're holding all the courts accountable to, and the law, they're working with the law schools anonymously and the courts because what it came from was her um, having a, she was clerking for a judge and the federal court uh, judge um, didn't like her. He was unkind to her. He decided he went and sort of trash talked her. This is what I understand. Um, and she wasn't able to get jobs anywhere and she wasn't able to get any of the clerkships. And so she started the, this judicial accountability um, nonprofit of some sort. And its whole goal is to, and also she found that the law schools were, um, uh, because they wanted the judges to consider their um, uh, pull from their pool of students, would not um, share any of this information um, to, with the students. Um, and so that's why she created this, but it was because, and apparently this judge had a history of doing this to other women and there's other judges that do the same thing. And so you essentially get blackballed because a judge, sometimes it's because you're rebuffing their advances and they don't like it. Um, 
And so I, uh, it's, it's sort of an interesting crossover with the legal space um, in terms of how this is like actually a significant problem for women that do try to enter um, the legal fields through that route and end up getting blackballed essentially. I'd have to look up the organization, but someone was telling me about it at the luncheon. Yeah. Eliza and Shastman, I think part of it, it too, like I guess my last thought, probably not my last, I have 10 million thoughts on this, but <laughs> you know, we were saying earlier, you know, everyone we know has multiple of these stories and I've been guilty of it too, where I'm like, I, I can tell you, I don't personally have an egregious, you know, sexual misconduct story against me, but I have a thousand little sexual harassment or discrimination stories. And I am very guilty of being like, oh, but my, that little time that I was so insulting and treated like dirt compared to the male team doesn't matter. That doesn't rise to the level of this stuff. And I think we all do it because we know it's part of how things have always been. And it's, people are going through worse and it just, that it, that's how it perpetuates. And I mean, I am as much as part of the problem. Yeah, and I suppose that part of the thinking, I mean, I, I talked about, you know, some of the women I talked to who didn't want to talk about this, they don't want to talk about it because they're worried that, I, I'm interpolating a little bit, but they're worried about the impact on their careers or their lives by talking about it as if, as if they're doing something wrong by revealing mm -hmm the wrong that somebody else did. Um, and it, it, it's just a really, it's a mess. Or I've heard women say, oh, well, I didn't speak up. And so I'm but my part of the problem. Like I didn't do anything to make it stop. I mean, not, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to get trapped in that. I don't agree with that sentiment, but it's easy to get trapped in it. Yeah. All right. Well, I found them. Um, I put a link in the comments. It's the um, she was it's based solely on sexual harassment by judges and it's called the Legal Accountability Project. Yep. And um, it was founded by a woman. And now this is her what she does with her life. Actually, uh, that was an article she wrote, but here's a link to the actual project. I'd never heard of it before. Have you guys heard of it? And it's the <laughs> track not. judges who um, are accused of sexual harassment. Yeah. How do we expand that to? <laughs> yeah. A little bit of a tangent, but <laughs> no. In, no, no, in the realm. No. Yeah. All right. Oh, well, yeah. um, now what do we talk about? <laughs> I'm like, there's no good transition, Bob. Don't, there's no pressure for a good transition. Well, I was writing my articles on way back from the Boston summit. Can you transition to the Boston summit? I don't know. Uh, it's... I talked to that woman over, uh, heard about her over lunch at my summit. That's a transition. <laughs> They're not very good. Summit, well, not great segments. And, and what summit was that, Nikki? <laughs> It was the DC summit, AI summit. Should we talk about that, Bob, or do you want to talk about the other substantive one that's not a summit? I, I thought I saw somebody raise their hand for a second, but now I don't see it. So I was just trying to check if somebody had raised their hand. Uh, yeah, if somebody wants to say something, go ahead and raise your hand. We can we can call on you. But uh, um, yeah, so uh, we got two AI summits this week. Uh, uh, Nikki, you, you uh, spoke at one and... Uh, uh, Stephanie and I were at another, uh, and uh, maybe maybe we can compare notes a little bit. Uh, we the one that Stephanie and I went to was under so-called Chatham House rule, which means we can't uh, quote anybody anything anybody said there, or even identify anybody who was there. I guess although I just identified Stephanie as being there, so I don't know if I just broke. The well, rule, no, but... you can't. No, I think you can't attribute what you learned to particular people and their organizations right. so yeah. you're okay. you're attributing yeah. no wisdom to me as of yet so it's fine. right yeah okay <laughs> um and i mean i did write about it and, and i didn't attribute to it as a matter of, there was something i did want to attribute to somebody and I, I emailed them and they said oh sure i don't care but then by the time i heard back from them i'd already written the post so i didn't do it but um the uh there was a well, but so what, maybe we should start with the DC bar one where Nikki spoke, and then mm -hmm. and then we can maybe uh, share our impressions a little bit about the Harvard uh, summit. So Nikki, take it away. All right. So I 
submitted a, this is the, it's a law.com article, Cassandra, Cassandra um, Coyle, I, I'm not sure if I have Coyer. her last name correct. Yeah. Coyer, Coyer, that's it, was um, uh, covering it. And so she wrote an article on Legal Tech News about the summit. So I dropped that into the comments. Um, it was an all day summit that the DC bar pulled together pretty quickly, all things considered. Um, and it was a really uh, great lineup. Um, I uh, opened it with an hour and a half talk and then um, there was a talk on um, the ethics. Uh, Carolyn and Ed Walters um, spoke on um, uh, some practical applications too. And uh, there was, you know, it was a all day um, uh, seminar and uh, summit and it was, really well attended. There were probably over a hundred lawyers at it or legal professionals. And everyone was, I mean, what truly struck me about it was how interested everybody was in um, this topic and how they were sort of had a thirst for knowledge about it, which, you know, in the 15 plus years that I've been writing and speaking about the intersection of law and tech, um, little under 15. I don't even know how long I've been doing this. Yeah, 15 plus <laughs> years. But yeah, but yeah, I've never seen lawyers this interested in a topic as a whole. I mean, I've gotten so many speaking requests. I'm sure um, a lot of people are getting into it. I'm not, I'm not the only one, but um, <clears throat> like people really want to know about it at this summit. They were so interested in it. And um, one thing that was, you know, they had a lot of questions. They're really um, uh, curious and knowledgeable. Uh, after I spoke, um, uh, Someone came, a couple of people came up and talked to me, but one guy was, had to have at least been 80 years old. Like, I'm not even exaggerating. And he was like fluent in this. He was like an 80 year old attorney. And he even, he told me something that was, and I think Carolyn wrote about this in her, um, in a LinkedIn post as one of her tips. But what he told me that he does. And you're in terms suggesting of the, that old people are not <laughs> capable of being fluent in AI it's stuff. It's pretty unusual to have an attorney <laughs> of that um, uh, generation to be, that fluent about tech. I mean, come on, it's it's unusual, right? Like, I mean, he had to at least been 80. He was a pretty old fella. Um, I was just very surprised. I mean, I'm not trying to be like a ageist. I probably am. But um, <laughs> listen, I'm not all that young myself anymore. But <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he um, told me that in terms of hallucinations, one thing that he does is he takes the results from one um, cat, like chat GPT and pops it into BARD or into Bing and says, is this accurate? And so he fact checks, he fact checks it across the different um, tools, which I thought was an interesting way to do it. I'd never thought of that. And that may be one way, like a temporary um, stopgap measure that lawyers can take until hopefully this hallucination issue is addressed and the legal tech products were able to um, build this into it and guardrail it and prevent that it happening from happening as much as possible. But I mean, the thing that really stood out to me was just the interest and um, it's just the number of attorneys that were there. And I think it's striking. And there's just such an energy when they're actually so interested in what you're saying. It was a lot of fun to speak at too. So, so I just, so somebody, I just saw somebody in the, in the comments say, if there's an AI summit where data scientists are also invited, I'd like to know about that. That's the way <laughs> we were at that one. Uh, there were definitely uh, data scientists at the one that Stephanie and I went to. It was uh, hosted by the uh, Library uh, Innovation Lab at Harvard Law School. And uh, it was a, a, an eclectic uh, group. It was an invite only summit. Uh, and, and I don't think, I think I sort of wrangled my way into it. Um, and of course, Ed Walters was at ours too. So as make of the rounds of all these, uh, <laughs> but um, it was, a, I mean, there were, there were, there were MIT scientists and, and, uh, uh, you know, Harvard academics uh, and uh, tech company uh, people and uh, practicing lawyers, people, you know, in, in innovation and, and knowledge management roles, law librarians. It was a real interesting and mix of people who were there. Judges who wanted to learn about uh, the it. Judges, too. The ju there's yeah. a whole group of Massachusetts judges who, uh, yeah, they were they were probably some of the most interesting people there yeah. in the sense of seeing how they what they had to say and, and responded to this. But what, what did you so what did you think, Stephanie? Of it? I thought it was well, then this sort of ties into the question of like, how do I find out about these things? I think they're starting to pop up more because my understanding of how this one came about is they had the one after Codex that was the invite only day. And it was such a hit that 
you know, case tech sponsored both of these, they wanted to do the Harvard one, which was originally going to be right after AAAL in Boston. And then as Harvard got more involved, it got bumped. And so this was the first time of that. So I think they're starting to pop up. So it's not necessarily a matter of like, how did I miss it? Um, and particularly like between comparing those two that I was at, I would say like this one was definitely much more academic and theoretical, which is not a bad thing. Like there's just, I think there's different conversations. The, the Stanford one was much more technical, like in the weeds of the technology. This one was more, I, I felt like, <laughs> I felt like I was actually back in law school, but with people who really understand technology. It was a, a, a bizarre feeling and not necessarily a bad one, but there was a lot of talk about not just like how this works, but almost like hopeful, like wh what can we do with this? What would we like to see someone do with this? As opposed to, and it was like overall positive, which I liked, like about the potential of this technology. Yeah, yeah. And I thought it was part of what, what I thought was interesting was that I think probably you could you could effectively say that everybody in the room was more or less a a, a cheerleader for uh, generative AI, but but with a lot of caution around it, I thought. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, the the I mentioned earlier, I think that I wanted to uh, quote one of the speakers in in my article, and uh, that that speaker was Jonathan Zittrain, who's the uh, Harvard law professor and who runs the uh, uh, the the whole library uh, program. I think he's the librarian as well or something at Harvard oversees the library innovation lab uh, and, you know, a long time uh, innovator in, in uh, the, uh, the the tech and Internet world. But but uh, he was to, he used a phrase that I thought was really clever, which was uh, uh, a distributed denial of justice attack, you know, a play on distributed denial mm -hmm. of, of service attack. But to talk about the fact that um, you know, on one hand, it's, it's a positive thing to start making, you know, if we're if we're able to start using generative AI in a way that can help address the justice gap and, and make those who do not have a lawyer somehow better equipped to help themselves with legal problems through generative AI, you know, on one hand, that could be a really good thing. On the other hand, um, you could really have this onslaught on the courts of suddenly you know, you, you've effectively lowered the price of admission uh, for filing actions in the courts, I don't mean financially, but by making it really easy for self-represented litigants to draft legal documents and draft complaints and institute legal actions, then you could have this real flood of, of uh, lawsuits in the courts. And his point wasn't to necessarily say we shouldn't do that so much as to say that the courts uh, need to be ready for this. And, and the courts need to be thinking about how can they be using generative AI in order to make themselves more efficient, make themselves more prepared to deal with all these cases that are going to be hitting them. Um, and I thought that seemed to, to uh, um, sound, a, sound a note with those judges who were sitting in the room, who I think most of whom really hadn't really thought much about generative AI, but by the end of the program, they were talking about, you know, how can we expand kiosks in the courts and and, and what can we do to uh, make services more available to self-represented litigants in the courts uh, so that was a really interesting uh, aspect of it i thought yeah um, one thing i just went and grabbed they gave us these notebooks and i old school took handwritten notes one thing that i thought was a really interesting point that someone was saying in terms of their caution and their informed caution about rolling this out is that there's a real concern that they don't want to do it in a way that creates detractors from it because you can never win it back. You can mm -hmm. never win those people back. So it's one thing if people are still on the fence, but if you do it the wrong way and people that are inclined to be against this technology become staunchly against it, you, you're not winning those people back and it just hurts the cause of trying to roll it out. I thought that was a really interesting consideration for people that are trying to create large program, AI programs, you know, not just getting single adopters or things like that. Yeah. And if I recall, that was the woman, again, I'm not going to say her name, but We're not supposed with, to a, say. with a big, <laughs> with a big firm that has already, it was one of the early adopters yes. of case text co-counsel. And, and she was in part talking about the fact that even though the firm was an early adopter of co-counsel, getting the lawyers to actually use it is, is a, another hurdle to overcome. And that there are some there are some lawyers who are you know super enthusiastic about it, others who are a little uh, cautious or, or even dubious about it. 
uh, and uh, it, and she, you know, I, I think that was kind of your point, as you said, that you need to you need to kind of be a little ginger about how you how you roll that out and how you get people mm-hmm. starting to use it so that they're not turned off by it. Right, and there was also <laughs> sort of hand in hand with that, there was a lot of talk from various different people about how this is going to have to play into retraining lawyers both currently the existing ones and upcoming ones, which I mean, this is not a new concept that's come up a lot, but I think it's one that nobody has really figured out the answer to yet. And I don't think there is one answer to it, but it's a, yeah. it's, it's turning out to be a bigger struggle. Yeah. Well, I was, I was not at either of the summits, but <laughs> I have been thinking about sort of along the, the, the line of but the pro se litigants. I think there are, still a lot of lawyers who who don't appreciate the tsunami of information that that people who are not lawyers can now have access to and um you know the the old days of the lawyer knowing and being able to to bs his or her way around client concerns or issues and all of that that's probably not going to work as well as it historically has and I I'm not sure that the the outside lawyers and law firms are prepared to face clients or would be clients that have a lot of information and can do a lot of things on their own that, that they couldn't do before yeah yeah and I'm what, the, other, the, go yeah go ahead oh sorry I saw people bringing up the a to j issue in the comments too. And I mean, that did, of course, come up. And I know at least some of the judges and I had dinner with, I was sitting with one of them at dinner too, were saying, we get so many of these papers. I mean, a lot of them are like, for example, in the space of emergency eviction orders, looking to stay evictions, and they'll have 125 of them a month. And they can't get through all of them. They have to like, we could just have the tools to surface the ones that might be better and start with those and, or give these tools to to these pro se plaintiffs to help them help themselves as opposed to necessarily meaning lawyers can, I mean, access to justice is not necessarily only giving them access to lawyers. Certain things are forms and certain things are based like that. And I thought that was, I mean, again, none of this is news, but things people have talked about, but I do think it's really interesting. And there is of course the danger that these tools only fall into the hands of the rich corporations and the rich firms because that doesn't get anyone anywhere. Yep. Along the lines of access to justice, um, I'm not sure if I've shared this before on this panel or not, but after um, one of my webinars, uh, I always get a bunch of emails, especially after these chat GPT webinars, and a lawyer emailed me and said that he'd been a public defender for much of his life. He was even the public defender in his jurisdiction, and now he takes um, solely a sign counsel matter somehow, um, and he makes a living doing that, and that he's been using um, generative AI in his practice and that he thinks that it's providing, helping him provide better representation to his assigned counsel um, clients in a way that is, makes it more on par with private counsel in a lot of ways, you know, not in every way, but he's able to give them a higher quality, a higher level of representation than he otherwise would be with the large caseload that he has. So I thought that was a really interesting sort of access to justice twist um, or variation in terms of um, use cases for this tool. When I was a public defender, I had 600 cases at a time. I mean, I committed malpractice every day. They were all misdemeanors. But you know, a, a way you know to have a tool that gives you this ability to streamline some of what you're doing, so you're able to give better quality representation to people that deserve it. They just can't afford it. You know, is a, a really um, promising way that this tech can be used. Yeah, I agree with that. But I, on the other, on the flip side of that, I was I've been getting frustrated. I think I talked about this in my in my blog post. But I'm getting frustrated by how many times at, at at when I'm at a legal tech conference and they talk about generative AI, how generative AI can use to be used to address the justice gap. They talk exclusively about increasing the productivity of lawyers, uh, and and <laughs> I I you know I continue to believe that lawyers alone will never be the answer to solving the justice gap and that we really need to expand our view on this to, to talk about how this technology can be used to empower consumers directly, not mm-hmm. just those who are working with lawyers. I mean, important, you know, increasing the productivity of lawyers is very important and can, it can be significant in, in addressing some of the needs out there, but it, it's never going to 
get us over the over the hump unless we are, are using this technology directly to consumers. And even for the aspect of education, the people that don't meet might not even know they have legal rights or that they could be you know, contested with a single form as opposed to in certain circumstances, just getting that empowerment out there may, will make a difference too. And hopefully these tools will just be able to reach more people. Yeah. There was one thing I wanted to point out um, of just about, it was something that I learned right before the conference and then Carolyn's done some really good work on it. I don't know how many of you are aware of the data analytics function of ChatGPT. Um, that they rolled out, but you have to learn, know how to turn it on. And then you can upload like a huge spreadsheet of data, like tons and tons of data. Um, and it can analyze it and you can do question and answers and ask questions. And it does a really, really cool job. And so that um, of analyzing huge chunks of data. And if you were to try it out, you have to turn it on in the settings of your ChatGPT account and you have to have ChatGPT plus. Um, but it is um, a fantastic way to make use of data. And you know there are all sorts of ways it could be applied across court systems in the access to justice functionality too, sort of to do some of what you're talking about, maybe like to surface some of the cases that really merit the attention. But if anyone has access to ChatGPT+, I highly recommend you check it out and um, play around with it. It's an unbelievable tool with a ton of functionality that they've kept on there, as long as you're a subscriber. A little yeah. bit of an aside, but Thank I wanted you. to mention that. Yeah. That. On that same score, Nikki, Microsoft, I think this, this past couple of days announced that the, their product is coming out for both for Windows in general and for, for 365. Um, but I read through the announcements. I didn't attend the, the, the program, but I didn't see the cost. So <laughs> there's always been a lot of speculation <laughs> what it's going to cost to get it. <laughs> Wasn't it like thirty dollars per user per month or something? It came out that's, with some number that was people. That was that was yeah that that was the rumored number for a while. And you know when I saw the announcement, I thought I, I bet sure they're going to say what they plan on charging. But it wasn't. At least I didn't see it in there. Maybe I missed it. Um, but uh, you know that's anyway. <laughs> yeah. Somebody was asking about the Bard integration with Gmail, and uh, I don't know if anybody saw. I think it was. I forget, it was the Washington Post or the New York Times tech columnist the other day had a, had a story about his trying to use the uh, integration in Gmail and uh, the, he got some really funny results. It, it did not do well. Uh, it was not it was not a good outcome. Uh, and some of it was just down, really, really hysterical in terms of the results it was it was delivering. But, but I feel like um, you also sometimes I like we're in such a bubble, I lose perspective of how there's plenty of people out there, even in legal, who don't really even they haven't touched any of this. They haven't really done a dive into right. this because like I was actually I was moderating a panel last night in Philly um at, at for blank Rome and had four fantastic attorneys on it and there was a the audience was a group of general counsels like various clients of theirs and like the questions it was it was almost hard to I mean the, the panel was great the attorneys were fantastic but it was almost hard because some people in the audience were like I've never even opened chat GPT tell me what it is to Hey, we're worried about issues of patentability and all of this. Like it was a, such a broad range. And yet, everybody's heard of the case of the the lawyer misciting. Uh, <laughs> the As a matter of fact, the guy from um, yeah, I was the free free law project at the, at the Harvard AI Summit. Uh, you know, they, they've got their uh, Pacer database of of uh, documents free. They make free access to Pacer documents through their well, and database. And court listener too. And, yeah. And, yeah. 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 Court listener. Yeah. Um, and, and he said that uh, that. The, the three most downloaded cases in the entire history of their organization, the first two are court cases involving Trump. <laughs> and, and the third one was the uh, the case involving the lawyer. Uh, yep. Mata via Bianca. Yeah. Chat GPT. yeah. Yeah. So that was kind of funny. Well, um, Trump's, Trump's looking for a lawyer. I mean, <laughs> there you go. Someone mentioned in the comments to uh, highlight the confidentiality issues with data analytics. Um, I would note that they, I did a little bit of a deep dive into that, and it's, it looks to me like it creates a unique Python environment for that specific type of query, so it's not your traditional um, ChatGPT query, and that that may add a level of protection, but I couldn't 100% confirm that, so I did keep that in mind when I entered data, so that was a good call out. And then just bringing up the cases stuff that y'all just mentioned, that's one of the things Carolyn did is she 
uploaded a spreadsheet of all sorts of federal court data pulled from PACER um, to try to analyze sort of kind of like what you do with um, litigation analytics, but to try to pull analytics out of the data using ChatGPT to figure out about judges and where to file cases. And so it has tons of interesting applications in that regard too. Definitely not how you guys are talking about PACER, but I thought that it was interesting what she's been doing with it. Well, we should we should uh, make sure we don't close out the week without one more law firm behaving badly story. And Steve has one <laughs> for us this week. So. Well, that was a good transition. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, the story that that I have is is pretty pedestrian compared to everything else, but it it caught my eye because what what happened was there was a uh, a person who. Um, brought a uh, unlawful termination case against Charter, I think. And uh, the lawyers for Charter, of course, went to Charter and got all the relevant records about, about this person, uh, including some personally identifiable information, of course, as you would expect. Well, the, the law firm was hacked and um, the information, all of this information was allegedly taken by the wrongdoers uh, which is bad enough, but the law firm waited over a year to provide notice that, that this had occurred. And the, the reason it's kind of, I mean, you know, there's a lot of these kind of stories out there, but I've never seen an issue where the the data that was taken was was information about and 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 owned by an adverse party. And there's a lot of cases where, you know, and opinions about what a lawyer obligation is to his or her client if there's a data breach. And we have a body of law, of course, that, you know, what you're supposed to do if you have a data breach about giving notice. But it just sort of the tension of this whole thing where you have a, a law firm going, to, debating whether to give notice to someone who's an adverse party. And I can just imagine you know, all the discussions and, and consternation about that. I mean, clearly, clearly to me, waiting that long is too long. They should have given a prompt notice. But just the temptation there to, well, you know, how's that going to affect our case? And, you know, what's the ramification? And, you know, we could get an advantage out of this. And it's just, you know, it, it just struck me that the, the possibility for abuse is there. The other question that I, that I had and it, what didn't seem to be addressed was whether the law firm had given their client notice about the breach before they gave notice to the world, which raises yeah, a whole host of other wondering. issues. Yeah. yeah, a whole host of other issues. Um, so, you yeah, know, it'll be interesting to see how that all sort of sort of plays out. Um, you know, that's a question about what what obligations do you have as a lawyer with respect to an adverse party in litigation? and and providing information is maybe an area that's, you know, we're going to have to deal with and figure out. But I just thought it was kind of an and, interesting situation. And what obligation to your client? I mean, you, you, you said there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of law on there and what you're supposed to do in terms of it in, in the event of a data breach in terms of informing your client. But I wonder how many firms are actually doing that because I, well, it yeah, seems that there right. have been a number of stories in which, you know, uh, until that uh, until that hacker starts posting uh, law firm documents on the dark web or, or something like that, looking looking to get paid some money that that firms are are trying to keep these things quiet. And, and uh, you know, there, there certainly have been some notorious cases in recent years in which the firms had not told their clients until right. the word le leaked out, you know, that way. And, and then and then they had no obligation, no uh, choice but to tell their clients. You know, I, I attended I attended a summit a few years ago and in the audience was was outside lawyers and inside counsel. And the question was posed. You know, if, if a law firm suffers a data breach, even if none of the information has been revealed or, or possibly could be revealed, do, do you have an obligation? And, you know, almost all the lawyer, outside lawyers in the room say, well, you know, if it's been breached, but nothing's been done with it and there's no harm, no foul, no. And all the clients in the room said, are you out of your mind? We absolutely expect you to tell us, even if it's not been, you know, taken or anything done with it. I mean, we, we have a right to know that. And that just struck me that, you know, now we got these, you know, kind of completely different views of what should be done. And yes, anyway, it's, it's an interesting area, but more, more and more companies are being more uh, 
doing a lot more due diligence of their lawyers in this area as they should. That, sounds, that sounds so much like that, you know, like if a tree falls in the woods and nobody is there to hear it, is that I'm like, no, I mean, yeah, yeah. you have a data breach, do something about it. Yeah. 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 And, and the actual hypothetical was, you know, suppose that, that a laptop is stolen with sensitive client information on it. You have a duty to tell your client or maybe better put, should you tell your client? And in that situation, you know, most of the most of the in-house counsel in the room said, whether you have a duty or not as your client, we're, you should tell us about that. And most of the lawyers said, no, no, no. Well, I think the, I, I mean, I don't think the ABA, there's an ABA ethics opinion on, on your duty to 43. discuss uh, data protection with, your, uh, with yeah. your clients. And I think that would pretty clearly address that and make very clear that you have to, you do have to tell them, but I don't know. What do I know? I'm no lawyer. Well, maybe I am. I am a lawyer. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, if you haven't seen enough of us here on this show, uh, we'll all be, we'll all be, no. Nick, are you going to Relativity Fest? You go to that? Uh, they invited me, but I, I just didn't have the bandwidth to go. Okay. Well, Steve so no. and Stephanie <laughs> and I will be at Relativity Fest. You're going to Relativity Fest, right, Stephanie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're yeah, on a panel right. together, aren't we? That's right. Yeah, we're all on a panel. And, and Joe Patrice will be the, there. And uh, yeah, I couldn't make the prep call for that panel, so I mean, I'll just be winging oh, it. Oh, we I just assigned that. everything to you. Don't worry about it. Cool, love it. For, for everybody so going to AI, I'm set. <laughs> for everybody going to Relativity Fest, you should go to Bob and Stephanie's panel. It promises to be quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe and I are time. also. Joe and I and Isha are all on a panel together right after that. So we're back to back. So if you don't really, well, I, if you. I think Isha's on our panel too. Yes. Well, I think she's on the one I'm on. And, yeah. and uh, she was she was on the prep call. So I, was, I know, I know. So I, I rely, can rely on yeah. her. So, and, yeah. and of course, David Oregon, uh, who was on our show last week and is sometimes panelist here will be moderating all of that. So. Uh, and I'm and, told yeah, it involves. Maybe we can bump into yeah. Mark Palmer wandering around out there. Right. In I'm told it involves buzzers and I don't know to what effect. So I really am at a disadvantage for not being at the prep call. Everyone's just going to buzz me. I'm I have no sure idea. I understand the buzzers either, <laughs> honestly. So, all right. Well, uh, and then uh, with any luck, we'll be back here next Friday to talk about uh, Relativity Fest and whatever else has gone right or wrong in the world of legal tech next week. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks everybody. Have a good week. Yep. Good so weekend, all. Yep. Bye bye.